speaks of being at one with God. We're not just brought together with Christ, but are grafted into Him, becoming one. That's really important. Most people just kind of join with Jesus. He, just, he wasn't just walking down the street with a big group of people and we joined the crowd. <coughs> We're in it. We're one with it. This is more than just fellowship with him or being in partnership with him. We are made one. It is not just knowing Christ is in you, but knowing a union has taken place and that now Christ is alive. What's the difference between just knowing that Christ is in you <coughs> or knowing that now you're in union with him? Well, you know, I can I can eat a parasite and it can be in me. <laughs> but it is not me. I appreciated what Chris shared just before the class. Very much so I appreciated what Chris shared. Because it speaks of taking your place. Not just that God did it, but you taking your place. That you doing that. That you, when you're bombarded and affected by everything in this earth, that you say, hey, I believe what God says about me, that I'm in Him, and that I am accepted, more than accepted, made one. That was really, that was really good to touch the Christ. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the prayer, too. <clears throat> because... My biggest burden, my biggest problem isn't the devil. My biggest problem isn't sin. My biggest problem is that I want people to know the Lord. Not know about the Lord, not become Christians. I want people literally knowing the one that we're one with. Um, the next sentence here says, it's not just knowing Christ is in you, but knowing a union has taken place. And that Christ is now your life. Since we're in union with Christ, then spiritual growth for us is in knowledge of Christ. There's no spiritual growth aside from Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.18 shows that our change is into the image of Christ. Our change is not better. Our change is not more spiritual. Our change is certainly not more Christian. Because a whole lot of what you see as Christian is not really Christ. Right? It may be Christian, but it's not Christ. Since we're in, um, let's see, God did not just love us so much that he gave us salvation. And I appreciate what was being shared about appreciating salvation, we, and that's definitely a case. We were in Ireland, and, and, uh, and over there, many of the people we talked with, their whole reason for serving the Lord in duty is because they're thankful for salvation. But I want to tell you that we got something greater than that. Not that we shouldn't be thankful for that, because I'm thankful every day. I too would be dead. Um, for sure. I'd either be dead or in prison. And there's no question in my mind. But no. I mean, absolutely, I'd either be dead or in prison. There's just no question in my mind. So, yes. I'm thankful to be saved. But once saved, you begin to realize that he didn't just save Randy, because that wouldn't have been enough for me. It would be for most people, I guess. It wouldn't be enough for me. But he joined me in him and gave me his life and gave me the hope of his life. You know what? There's no way to put that in words. No way. All right, next sub subtitle on the Another life, another nature. Hmm? Another life, another nature. The Father puts his son in us. When Jesus comes in, so does his nature. If somehow we, we don't realize that. We said Jesus came in, but not his nature. But that's not true. Who he is is the lamb and the way that he is in this way. Um, Jesus puts his heredity in us. The teachings of Jesus match the nature that is put within us, such as uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, we, we look at that and we say, well, those are some good teachings. 
But that's according to his nature. You try having somebody slap you and see if you turn the other cheek without the nature of Christ. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. The teachings match the nature, and the teachings without the nature are pretty much, they'll pretty much bum you out. Because <laughs> you won't be able to do them. Mm -hmm. But you'll try, and then you'll fail, and then you'll go into despair. Okay. Hopefully that, if you do it and you go that direction, hopefully that despair will cause you to cry out and then you'll begin to see the life of Christ and the needs of his nature and his life within you. Um, the teachings of Jesus, let's see, the victory over the sin nature comes in two ways, crucifying the old nature and imparting <coughs> Christ's nature in your heart. So it's real simple. There's the old man is drawn like this. There's the old nature. And then with Christ, you crucify this one, and this one goes on the inside of you. You say, how can that big thing fit inside of me? Mm -hmm. It's called the Lord. It's called his, new birth. yes, called the new birth, which we will talk about if we get that far down. So <clears throat> just learning about uh, and there are people that sound like they agree with us and they teach what we teach. They talk a lot about death and dying and the cross and everything. But it's not all about death and dying and the cross. It's about putting to death the old man, the nature of the old man, yes. But more importantly, it's about the life of Christ. Okay, so it's not just death. It's not just getting rid of something. And if you're always thinking in terms of getting rid of something, then you're not, you're not pondering life. Because life is the increase of something. Not that you don't have him fully, but the increase in your understanding of him so that he is able to live his life within you. God's highest goal and achievement, the highest thing that God wants to do, will not be the removal of Satan from your circumstances. We, you know, if we can just get the devil out, Adam and Eve, well, if there hadn't been no devil, can you see him after the fall? Well, if there hadn't been no devil, everything would have been perfect. No, they didn't have Christ in They were not sons of God. It's not Christ. It wouldn't have been perfect. Not in God's heart. Oh, maybe in their heart. But after all, what are we after? We're after God's heart. We want to know His heart. And that's what we're after. So, it's not the removal of Satan from your circumstances. But the forming of Christ in man and making sons of God. God did not send Paul a thorn in the flesh to limit him, but to open him up to greater strength. Thorn in the flesh. It says, The Lord sent the messenger of Satan to buffet him. What's up with that? I thought Satan was the enemy and God was the good guy, and this was a big war against good and evil. No, 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 you're fighting on one tree. God allowed the enemy to limit, to limit, to, br to bring in the walls and to limit what he did and how he did it and all those things so that the only way he could do what he did was by a greater strength from Christ. God was not trying to hurt him or ruin him or mess with him. God was trying to put him in a position where he would call on a strength that was not his own, a life that was not his own. Christ. God's heart is, by the way, God's heart is good. It's better than it is God. It's, it's his heart. He's not trying to mess with us in the sense that most of us think. He has one thing in his mind, and that is to bring forth the fullness of his son so that we might be fulfilled. We might know what fulfillment is all about. <clears throat> we, not just in our weakness, but in our strength, limit God. Can you see how in your strength you can limit God? Because you're doing everything. You're dependent on yourself. <coughs> you're dependent on what you can do. It's like when I first came to the Lord, I said, okay, now I can... I can play guitar, and I can do this, and I can relate in this way, and I can do this, but I can't do this, this, and this, so I need Jesus here in the areas that I can't do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And so I would always depend and pray and really look to Jesus in the areas that I was weak in, but in the areas that I was strong in, I said, oh, you know, I don't need Jesus there. That 
was my understanding. That was the concepts that I had. And, you know, maybe some of you still have those. I don't know. But you, there comes a place where you go, I want it to be, I want Christ as all and in all, in all areas. I don't want my strength. I want him as my strength. I don't want my peace. I want him as my peace. I don't want, you see what I'm saying? I don't want wisdom because I'll get puffed up. I want him as my wisdom. And God takes you off of that road and he sets you on a road that's real simple. It's Christ. It's the Lord. And you just start, you know, all of the religious things start falling away and you just start getting after God. Your heart goes after him. <clears throat> we tend to evaluate uh, circumstances as if they are good or bad based on how they limit our ability. And this is really true. This statement right here, if you studied it for the next 10 years, you probably wouldn't fully understand it. We tend to evaluate circumstances as if, as to if they're good or bad based on how they limit our ability because we've not identified in Christ and still think in terms of independent self. Paul in prison. Oh, so limited. Can't reach any souls. Can't talk to anybody about Jesus. So he sits there and writes the whole New Testament almost. That reaches not just them that they were sent out to, but made into the Bible. And almost every Christian after that reads those letters and are affected. And the Spirit of God moves on and can change them. If he's sitting in that cell going, I'm so limited. God, why did you do this? Satan seems to be stronger than you. You know, and you, you can believe the devil is talking to him. You can believe that his carnal mind was just like John the Baptist. John's going, you know, what's the deal? What am I doing in prison? I'm the only person who really knows who you are, and I'm locked up. This ain't right. You know, we need to change some things. Come on, Lord. You know, when I was in Bible school, I spent three years in Bible school, three glorious years of searching the scriptures and seeing Jesus. And I mean, by the time I graduated, I was so full and I was so ready to minister this gospel and what I had seen. I was so full of life. And so the, elder, the elders came to me and they said, well, we'd like for you and Deb to go to the mission field. We'd like you to go to Jamaica. Said, okay, so here's the big moment. We're sent to Jamaica sent to the mission field. We're not sent to the cities. We're sent off into the bush area, way back away from most of civilization. And all that's there is little children primarily. And they can't understand the revelation of Christ. And for two years, I'm ministering to these kids, and I'm going, what the heck am I doing here? God, why did you reveal all this stuff to me and not give me enough? Are you just a knucklehead? Don't you understand? I am your man. I am your Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I thought all those thoughts. I thought you you have missed it. You have missed it. You should have sent me to the nations. And then the Spirit of God began to deal with me, and all of a sudden I'm starting to say, You didn't miss it at all. This is exactly where I need to be. I'm not denying that. I think I'm something based on what I've seen. I didn't get a thorn in the flesh, but I got limitations. That's what Paul received by that thorn in the flesh. He was limited. He was brought in to a very small area where he himself had no ability and no power to go do a bunch of stuff. And that's what happened to me. And then I began to realize this thing is not first and foremost about anybody else that's right here. If I don't get this, if I don't know him, if I'm not changed, if, I, if I've got any junk of me in here, then I am tainting this whole deal, and I need to get serious. And this is after I graduate. I need to get serious. You know, I need to get serious with God. So, we're, because we have not identified in Christ and still think in terms of independent self. In this way, it is what Christ can do for you to improve your quality of Christianity. He was trying to improve my quality of Christianity. No reason not. Instead of your whole being in Christ. Christ in you. Our mind must be renewed to the real purpose of God. And, and that's the real deal right there. Our minds are not renewed. They're carnal. They're, they're, you know, I, again, I appreciate what Chris shared because to even 
be able to draw any, any hope out of this, this above place in him, to be able to find any encouragement there, you've got to believe it to some degree. <laughs> It's just a wisdom of heaven if you don't believe in it. You know what I mean? It is just nothing. It's just a doctrine. And I'm telling you, man, you can gather all the doctrines around you you want. And when the enemy hits you or circumstances or crisis or whatever start messing with you, those things just they just all fall down around your ankles. You know? You need something that's going to lack, something that's real. You know, in, in, in this place, it's kind of a protected environment. You don't know how much you need something that's going to last and something that's real. But you get into places later, and like Molly said, you'll go, thank God. <laughs> and then I, I got what I was supposed to, you know, because because just, you know, I'm going to get back into here, but, you know, we've had a whole lot of people come to go. We've had people sit here three years and then, then be on the staff for years and years after that and not have a clue about Christ and the Now, how does that work? Mm -hmm. How does that work? We've had people that have been around for 20 years and not really have a clue. We have people that teach it and don't know. Well, they're teaching it, so it's got to be right. It's got to be good. It's not about teaching. It's about Christ. It's about the real deal. And I have no desire to run long bodies through a building every three years. And I'll say, well, but aren't you encouraged that? No, I'm not encouraged that. I'm encouraged in Christ. I'm encouraged when I see life. You know, I'm encouraged by Him. But other than that, I got no hope in the earth. The only hope I got is that we begin to see Him and manifest in this earth. But we're not out there. We are truly in Him. And that will encourage you. And it will give you identity. And that's what you were really saying. Because, you know, a lot of people can say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in Christ. And, you know, bless God. You know, especially if things are going good. But, you know, you sound like you've been discouraged about who you are and your identity and stuff like that. And yet, you, you found encouragement in Christ. And that's good. That's good. Keep it up. Don't let that slip, bro. It's not a one-time deal. You get in the Word, man, and you just keep feeding. You know? And if nobody else does around me, you keep doing it. I know others are, but you keep doing it. Because you love the Lord. And because that, that you've heard that. That when I sat there, you, you didn't speak up right away or anything. But when you did, I knew that you said something that you heard from God, not just in class. And I'm speaking to everybody now, but I'm speaking to you because I heard the Lord there. And, and the enemy, you know, when that word is sown, the, 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 the sower sows the seed. The enemy comes in to steal that word. You don't have to steal that word, that word. It's eternal. Don't have to get that one away. Praise God. All right. The next part that we're going to have to deal with here is really a summary of the whole book. So here's, here, I'm going to go through it first, uh, and then we'll come back. If we have any time, we'll read it. We discussed this earlier. Man made spirit, soul, and body. And the next subtopic, man died spiritually. When Satan came in and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of evil, the basic thing that happened to man's spirit was he died spiritually. We discussed this in class with this particular uh, the subtitle really discusses it. God, uh, before the fall, man was able to commune with God and God with man through his spirit. Okay, And so there was this relationship, not based on just the soul or the body, but his spirit. But the, but the Bible says that man died spiritually. Okay, that doesn't mean that his spirit ceased to exist, that it died as we understand death. It meant that he was cut off from God through sin, and that he no longer functioned by his spirit, but began to function by his soul. Okay, So in one sense, it was as if he didn't have a spirit, but in truth he did, but he, he uh, was not relating to God by spirit because he had 
it had fallen into disuse, and I've, I've got it. The word in here is a lot better, and I'll read it in just a second. But, but, to, but to let you understand that his spirit did not cease to exist. He still had a spirit. He was just no longer relating to God. So it was as if there's a wall there uh, on that level. So man began to function by his soul and by his body. All right, if you got a book, go on to page 44 because I'm going to summarize and then come back and read it. All right, so to, to restore man back, one of the first things that God does is that his spirit is regenerated. Okay, so this means that the Spirit of God regenerates, and of course we talked about the word re, meaning again, regenerate. So that meant that he had once functioned by his Spirit, but now has not, but now he begins regeneration, and at that point he begins to relate back to God again. His Spirit is now alive, okay, and it's alive to God. All right. Then the other thing that we, we just finished talking about, we just wrapped up on, was that more than just man's spirit coming alive, Jesus himself dwells. He came in here by his nature, and he dwells in your spirit. Okay. So that's more than just your spirit being made alive again. It is Christ also dwelling in your spirit. Do you see the difference? One is new birth, the other one is regeneration. One, one is brand new, one is re. New, re. Regeneration is something that wasn't, or something that was, and then it wasn't, and now it is again. Okay? If you, if you recharge your battery, it meant it was charged once. Mm -hmm. So now you're recharging it because it died. All right. But when you recharge your battery, is that, does that make it a new battery? No. Same battery. But now it's alive. All right. That's what regeneration does. The new birth of Christ coming in is more than recharging your battery. It's like getting a whole new battery. So you get a combination of two things. You get Christ in there in new birth, and your spirit is regenerated, and he dwells in it now. There are some people that teach, and even some people that we have come in our Bible school, that will say something like, well, man doesn't even have a spirit. Christ is your spirit. And in truth, if you begin to know the Lord and, you, and, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, you, whether you have a spirit or not will not matter to you. What will matter to you is that it's Christ. And so you, don't, you won't have a problem with that teaching. Because the way that you're pretty much functioning is by Christ anyway. Okay? But, just so you'll know, I believe that man has a human spirit. That's just my personal deal. I think, I think there's plenty of scriptures that bear that out. Of course, mm -hmm. others think there's plenty of scriptures that bear out, but you don't. So, I don't, you know, I don't desire to argue with anybody or whatever, but I believe that we are spirit, soul, and body, and I believe this the scripture says that God wants to sanctify us, holy, spirit, soul, and body. And so there's a sanctifying work of us. But there's, I mean, Jesus doesn't need to be sanctified, does he? Okay, well, you see what I'm saying? There? So, so I have reasons to believe what I believe. But I will say this, that many people who believe, as I do, that man has spirit, soul, and body, emphasize the human spirit just like huge. And I hardly ever emphasize it other, as a, other than as a container for Christ who dwells in your spirit. Okay? So, there you have a little extra mud to add to your, <laughs> your understanding. All right. So, the next subtopic under there is the regeneration of the human spirit. I just mentioned that. Uh, the purpose of regeneration. And again, I haven't gone over this, and we'll go back and reread it. All right. Then here on the, the, um, page 45, top of the thing, it says conversion without regeneration. <clears throat> All right. Do you remember we talked about conversion in one of our classes? Do you remember that? All right. And we said that the initial act of conversion, let's put God over here. God comes knocking on the door of this believer who is spirit, soul, and love. Okay? God comes knocking on the door 
trying to get him saved. All right. Is he knocking on the door of his spirit? If this is a sinner. This is a sinner that has not accepted Jesus yet, but God's knocking on the door of his heart. Does God talk to his spirit? No, because he is spiritually dead. Okay. God starts affecting him in his soul, and that's, that effect is called conversion. Okay? Where his soul says, I need Jesus. <laughs> you ever wonder why people respond that way when they accept the Lord? I think it has something to do with it being the soul. But the soul is where the will resides. Mind, will, and emotion. And the will makes a decision. What is that decision? I accept you, not just out here, but I accept you in here. And when God comes in, your spirit is regenerated and Christ dwells within you. So it's kind of like going like this. <laughs> okay? Can you see that? That we talk about regeneration, conversion, redemption. You need to understand all these truths. You need to have some kind of an understanding of it. Why? Because you're going to Bible school and you want to understand the Bible. Because you represent God, so you want to know His Word. You know, because you claim you're here to, to, to know Jesus, you want to just know the Lord. You want to know everything you can. You fell in love with Jesus, you want to know everything you can about Him because you're in love. Okay? So, so this isn't doctrine. This isn't teaching. This isn't schoolwork. This is knowing everything you can and going after it with all your heart. Okay? Alright, so, but can there be conversion without regeneration? And that's the next topic on page 45. Yeah. What happens is that God comes and he starts dealing with somebody. He starts dealing with their soul and they go, oh, okay, okay, I repent, I repent. Oh, I, I, I accept, you know, God, I don't want to go to hell. Of that was said right here in their soul. But they never receive the Lord in regeneration. Their spirit never gets regenerated. They never get born again. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that there are people in churches, Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, all sorts of Presbyterians, Lutheran, do you think there are people sitting in those churches who are not saved? Do you suppose there might be at least one person in maybe 10,000 churches in my side. It goes regularly. There are probably maybe two or three or maybe whole churches filled. Do you understand what I mean? Why? Because they have in their mind, remember the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. They have in their mind accepted that it is believable that Jesus could have actually died for our sins. They never get born again. They never get regenerated. But they have accepted these truths as believable. And so they say, well, and we're a Christian nation, and I'm a Christian. I should go to church, and they go to church regularly. But they have had conversion without regeneration. Okay? Is that enough? No. All right. All right, next uh, little subtopic. Born of the Spirit, but living by the soul. Now, let's take it another step. Let's say they get converted and they get born again. All right? So now their spirit's regenerated. Christ is in there. Then everything's wonderful. Everything's fine, right? Now everything's, it's going to be right because they didn't just get conversion without regeneration. No, because they, they're born again of the spirit, and God wants to relate by spirit because God is spirit, but they start living by the soul. They live by their mind. They live by their will. They live by their emotions. They come out of their soul. And they live by their five senses out of their body. See, feel, taste, touch, smell, da, da, da. Okay, so, you know, well, I feel God. See, I feel God. And there's nothing wrong with feeling God. But I'll tell you what, you can, you can find out how much soul is in the church service by just listening to people. Don't you just feel the love of God? Don't you just feel the presence of God? I mean, you just, a whole lot of it is very much the sense realm or in the soul. Now, again, you, 
if you're ruled by your spirit, you still have a soul and body, so you can actually feel God. But I tell you what, if God is flooding in and out of your spirit and revealing himself and growing there, you're not going, you know, I'll just feel really good. You know, you're going, the Lord is great. You know what I mean? The spirit of God was sent by Jesus to testify of him. The clearest sign that somebody is being dealt with by their spirit is when they're, they've been seeing things in the Word of God, of Christ. You see what I mean? Because that, that's life. They're talking about Him. They're not just talking about what they feel and how good it is. They're talking about Him. They're enraptured with Him. They're caught up in a Him, not a Him that makes me feel good. Because you know what? He may make you feel good, but what if, what if a new drug comes out that, that makes you feel way better than anything you ever felt in church service? No. You say, well, that's not possible. Nothing can, can feel better than God. Nothing can be better than God. Okay, well, let's say that that's true. Although I don't know it's true, but let's say that that's true. Um, but what if somebody did? If they did and it felt better, would you go after that? Particularly if that's what's really holding you, keeping you, making you feel, you know, well, I know God loves me because when I went to church, I just felt God all over me. Anybody ever heard something like that? Yeah. I know I got the Holy Spirit because it was like honey buckets being dumped on my head. Well, I'm, I've heard this stuff, you know what I mean? You know, I mean, I've heard this about everything, you know, a honey bucket. I have never heard that, and I'm sitting there going, honey bucket. <laughs> what? <laughs> honey buckets? feel like anyway. <laughs> and would it make any difference if it was molasses? <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, what is the, is the texture that different? But honey sounds better than molasses. <laughs> <laughs> so it felt like it was like this. And I'm just kind of, you know, I'm sorry. I, I'm on, I evaluate and I go, okay, what, what's the real deal going on here? Is this the Lord or is this the honey bucket feel? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, you know, a whole lot of it, not all of it, obviously not all of it, and again, you know, let me make sure, just because you're functioning by your spirit doesn't mean you don't have a soul in a body, and it doesn't mean you don't feel stuff too. Because you're lying up to your soul and body. But what's ruling is your spirit, and what's ruling in your spirit is Christ. Is that okay? Okay, you can still, you still feel stuff. You're not dead, you know, you're not devoted to you know, I got Jesus in me, but I don't feel me. I don't feel me. I'm just a God. And I've known Christians that do that. They go to that extreme. Yeah. They go, well, I'm just walking in my spirit, so I don't feel nothing. Well, you know, it's okay to feel. Just don't let it rule you. Don't let it be your primary God. It's okay to, to have joy in your soul. Either. But, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, Mary, when she went in there and, and saw uh, Elizabeth, who had John the Baptist in her, and John the Baptist leaped in the room, and she said, oh, she began to pray, oh, glory to God, glory to God. And Mary's standing over there with Jesus in her, and they're all worshiping and everything, and, you know, and it's, and it's a wonderful moment. There's only one difference. One's got Jesus in them, and one doesn't. Mary even said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God and my Savior. That was her word. Guess what? Her soul did, but her spirit did too. You see what I mean? It wasn't just, well, I'm just off in the soul and everything's, you know. It was, it was something happening in her spirit. Spirit's old eyes of God will sanctify your spirit, soul, and body. And they're... You know, again, others think that there is no significance to that order. I think there is all significance to that order. So I state these things. All right. So, so born in the spirit, but living after the soul. Um, and then comparing regeneration with new birth, which I already did. One is your spirit is regenerated. The other one is one of them is like the battery that I said that was. Charged, and then it went dead, and that's recharged. That's regeneration. The other one is like you get a whole new battery on the inside of your battery. All right, so let's go back because there's a lot of good stuff in here that I think we should uh, 
with the green. I was afraid we wouldn't even get a chance to look at it, but it looks like we've got a little bit of time here. <clears throat> How is it that Christ can come and live in us? There's only one way possible. Our human spirit must be regenerated. This is page 43, so I man that spiritually. All of you turn in there. See, I'm not a human body. I pay so proper. That's good. I said, well, if the Lord told me not to eat it anymore, I would. But I know that he doesn't do it. That'd be the devil. When man fell into sin, he died spiritually. What does it mean to die spiritually? To answer this question, Let's first answer what area of our being spiritual death affects. Sin caused man to die spiritually. It is something that happens to our spirit and in no way affects our body or soul except by reason of consequence. It is first and primarily a thing of the spirit and affects the spirit of man. What does spiritual death do to the spirit of man? Here we go. It causes the human spirit to cease to function contact or communicate, and I, I wrote here in the spiritual realm, but it really needs to say God. Because I believe that sometimes people use their human spirits when they're not born again and contact spiritual entities. <laughs> when man died, Spiritually, he was cut off from God. His spirit fell into disuse as far as being a means to contact God. It was not a situation in which man's spirit ceased to exist. Okay, so he was no longer functioning in relationship to God by his spirit. Uh, and uh, a good book to read on that, which you may not believe actually is a good one to read on is a book I wrote called The Revelation of Christ. And in there, it takes you through the history of man. And it shows you how the history of man through the Bible is related to different aspects of his soul, body, whatever, this sort of thing. At certain junctures, they heard voices, they saw angels, all this kind of stuff. And nowadays, that's not as prevalent because God is trying to deal with us by different means than that. It'd be good to read the book. You don't have to agree with it, but it would be good to read it and find out what it says. Um, all right. Being dead, and this is page 44, top of the page. Being dead in spirit means that man was severed from his source in God through the spirit and ceased functioning through his spirit. Uh, severed from God as his source. So when man sinned, he fell into sin, he was severed from God as his source. He became separated from God, which is a separation from every godly virtue. Now, it didn't mean he couldn't be good, because he ate of the truth and knowledge of good and evil. But godly virtues, the virtues that are from God, he was cut off from. He may have his own good, but his good is not God. It's not. It has one more own than God. So it's not God. But more than that, there's a lot of good people out here that don't know God. Good is not God. All right, remember to die spiritually does not mean to cease to exist, but to be separated from. Okay? A whole lot of people don't understand this. So they say, since I don't cease to exist, I'm okay. But you're walking as separate from the Lord. The day that I die, then I'll know I'm in trouble. That's a little too late. <laughs> you need to understand death in terms of as separation, not in terms of no longer ceasing to exist. Because we say, well, as long as I have any sort of desire after God, you know, and of course, you see, there's so much. It's incredible. We need, to, everybody needs to know the Bible and not just know the scriptures, but know the word of God as God says. Uh, Cain was a, was a man trying to do good, but more than good, he was trying to serve God. He was trying to offer up an offering that God would accept. He wasn't out there sinning or 
you know, robbing banks and committing adultery and stuff like that. He was off, he's up there taking his time to offer sacrifices to God. And when God didn't accept what he had to offer, he wouldn't kill his brother because his brothers was acceptable. It's still true today. Cain and Abel, Adam and Christ, they're still two, two natures. You're either one or the other. So we think that one is this evil, wicked thing, and I'm telling you the majority of scriptures have to say about that nature is that it's religious. And, it, and religious meaning, it says, I love God. You know? We talked about the repentance thing. I challenge you to go through the scriptures and find out the different people who said, I repent, I'm sorry, and cried out and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there was no, no regeneration, just conversion. You'd be shocked. You know who you'll find? You'll find Pharaoh. You'll find Judas. You'll find, I mean, I won't tell you about it. I also said almost exactly the same thing. And it sounded like real repentance to me. And if I went by what I heard and what I saw, I was there they repent. But I don't go by my senses. I don't go by the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says that they, that they were separated from him. Not because God separated them. God's the same. He never separates. God hates separating. He likes union. He hates separating. He likes union. Basic principle of God. If you know that basic principle, it's going to take up about three tons of fear out of it. <laughs> I'm glad I got a little response from somebody. If you really understand that basic principle of God, that He hates separating. I'm not talking about in lives and earthly appeal. You know, in that sense, I mean that's not that's not important to Him. What's important to Him is Him, and that we be joined to Him. He hates separating. He loves you. He loves it. He loves it. He wants it. And his heart never, ever, ever. In fact, whenever he takes an action that looks like separation, it is to bring you in union. Such as Song Solomon. She's in bed, he comes and on the door, she won't get up and says, Oh, I'm, I'm clean, I'm holy without you, I'm perfect, I'm doing so good, I don't need you tonight. He goes, Okay, I'll leave. And all of a sudden she's going, well, this is stupid. I'm in bed. I'm cleaned up. I'm looking good. And he just left. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she goes, well, you know, separation stinks. Well, why did he separate? To bring her out. Bring her out where? To, to him. So, well, let's say, no, no, no. There's this certain thing he's trying to bring us into. No, no, no. certain thing he's trying to bring us into. It's you, you, and him. It's a him. If it's a thing, it's a religion. To him, it's a relationship. Right, so, man is separated from the union he once had with God. That union and communica uh, communication was on a spiritual level through the spirit of man and the Holy Spirit. Though man still had a spirit, yet it was separated from God, causing it to fall into disuse, causing man to begin to function based on the soul and body. Knowledge of good and evil, which takes place in the soul, replaced walking in the spirit. Does that make sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. All right, regeneration of the human spirit. So the first thing that must happen is regeneration. In regeneration, the spirit of man is reinstated with union in God and given its proper position as the controlling force. Spirit is head. Spirit is head. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay. There is no spiritual life without the spirit of man being in control. And that's a fact. Now that seems so contrary to most churches because people are moving in the soul and they're feeling and they're doing all this stuff and they're saying how spiritual everything is. That's not spiritual. It may have spiritual. It may have the spirit moving in there, but it's not spiritual because that which is spiritual is of the spirit. It's not of the soul in the body. <clears throat> All right, so there has to be 
be life in the spirit before there can be spiritual life. Anybody ever heard that term before? There has to be life in the spirit before there can be spiritual life. Not just regenerate the spirit, but life in the spirit. All right, but this is regeneration or being brought back into the generation of God. And this is also recouping your image. You lost the image of God, you're back in the family of God. But actually, you're more. If you are in the family of God, you now have the image of Christ. All right, salvation does what no religion can do. You cannot re-educate a fallen human spirit out of its fallen state. It's like taking a pig and bringing him up and saying, Pig, you're a dog. I'm trying to talk him into that he's a dog. You know, just just receive the dog spirit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're going to be just fine. No. He is still a pig. He'll always be a pig. And see, this is the example that, that was given in the New Testament. It says that the, the dog is turned back to his vomit. The pig is turned back to the mind. Right. That scripture puts fear in the heart of everybody who doesn't know that God loves you and hates separation. Because they go, well then, you know, what the deal is is that I'm, I'm a dog, or I'm a pig, and I know that I'm going to turn back to the mire because, you know, every time God takes the leash off of me, I head for it anyway. So that's what I am. Well, what are you basing that on? What are you basing what you are on? Well, I'm basing on what automatically kicks into me when the opportunity is given. Well, you know what? Maybe you ought to base it on the Word of God. Maybe you ought to get in the Word and stay in the Word until you see Him and change into that image from glory to glory, and then you'll not be able to do what you are. Does that make sense to anybody? No. But we keep making our judgments, not here, not here, but based on whatever we're doing, thinking, actions, see, feel, taste, touch, on the soul. But we're not believing God's Word, and we're not believing the cross, we're not believing the resurrection, we're not believing the union, we're not believing His heart. You say, well, if I start believing it, I'm not any different. The next day, I'm probably going to, you know what? It's not going to happen the next day. It's going to happen after several days or weeks or whatever where you just begin to just press in and say, you know what? If this is true, and if, I'm, if I am in his heart and in the image that he says that I'm in, then I need to give my guts to finding this out in a real way. You know what I mean? I would hate to fool around in three years and basically have nothing in my pockets when I left. You know what I'm saying? I, would, I mean, I would want to just go and get everything I can. And I mean, after the war, I mean, study every class or whatever. You know, they, we, years later, after I graduated from college, uh, from Bible school, years later, uh, there came a situation where they needed my transcripts. And it just so happened that the guy who was the, the headmaster principal over at all the school, we knew where he was, and he had all the old papers. And so we contacted him, and he got all the old stuff, and he's going to figure out my transcript for him because some of them were going to be accepted by UNT and some other things. I forget who all of it. Anyway, so we dug him out, and they put him, and he figured it all out, and we figured it out. I had enough for a master's degree. Nobody told me that, but I had enough for a master's degree. How did I get enough classes for a master's degree in three years, when everybody else got a bachelor's degree out. How did that happen? I, now, I, I ended up with a bachelor's because I went three years, so they didn't, they just, you know, it's just like taking extra classes. Every night when they had an extra class, I was there. Every, every class I could get, including classes that I'm in the classroom over there, I had a take place going in this class. So. I mean, so I'd go back to my room and I'd listen to this class, because I got that class, and now I got this class too. Not because I'm going, oh, I'm going to get all the education I can get. I said, man, I, I don't want to, I don't want one word of God coming out of this place and let it drop to the ground. I want to pick up that. I want, I want to gather every precious word that ever came out of this place. I had no clue. I didn't know it. I didn't think about it. I was just hungry. I was in every class I could be in, and I was studying my little head off apart from class. In fact, I probably got more in my private time because I was always just in the Word, in the Word, in the Word. Why? Just because I wanted to know the Lord. I didn't, you know, I just, and I don't even 
remember thinking, well, I only got three years and this is real important and I better get it now because I want it later on. I don't, I don't ever remember thinking that there as much as this is it. This is my life. What am I going to be doing? I mean, I, I remember looking at myself and going, what am I going to be doing for the rest of my life? Serving Jesus, so it'd probably be good if I knew something about it. <laughs> probably be good if I knew the scriptures. Probably be good if I knew, you know, everything I could know in the Bible. So I better get out. Then I figured, okay, well, that can take me 20 years, or it can take me three or whatever. You know, so I just went, oh. you know, I swallowed everything I could, but I didn't really realize what I was doing. All right. All right, next subtopic, uh, the regeneration of the human spirit. So the first thing that must happen in regeneration is regeneration. In regeneration, the spirit of man is reinstated. Did I already do that? No, it is. Yes. Okay, at salvation, we are regenerated. You can't have something redone unless it already once was. Well, regeneration is redoing what once was. That is not new creation of restoration. New creation relates to eternal life, and restoration relates to everlasting life. Man once was in contact with God through his spirit. At salvation, he was brought back to relating to God on a spiritual basis. God is a spirit, and they that worship or serve him do so on a spiritual basis. And I'll give a couple of spirits, other spirits, scriptures that tell you that Paul said in Romans 1 9, I serve him from my spirit. Okay? So let me ask that question again. How is it that Christ can come and live in us? He dwells in our spirit, but he can only live in the spirit of someone who has been regenerated. The second thing that must happen is that God must once again become the source. God's nature was to be the source, and man's spirit was to be the channel. Okay. When the channel was shut down, all contact with godly virtue ceased, and man began to operate on an independent level through the soul. All right. So, when God shuts down the source, is it because God just all of a sudden says, well, I think I'll just shut down and quit being their source? Do you believe that's really true? Or do you think that maybe we shut down as a channel? You think, uh, uh, I can go forever on that. But, you know, the purpose of regeneration, get back into right relationship with God, two things must happen. First, man's spirit be regenerated, whereby men begin to operate by their spirit and not their soul. God wants the order of our spirit, soul, and body to be lined up properly. The goal of our spirit is to be the boss over the rest of our being. So this is what uh, David says. Soul, why art thou cast down? Hope thou in God. Now who's that talking? I know it's David, but that's his spirit talking. His spirit is talking to his soul. Soul, you remember the scripture in the Bible, the scripture in the Psalms? So, why art thou cast down? Hope thou in God. Well, that's not, that's not God talking. That's him. Remember even David, it says, when they attacked him in Ziglag and took away all their stuff, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I believe, I don't believe your soul can encourage yourself in that. I believe your spirit can. I believe if your soul does encourage you enough, it's fluff. And it will you blow on it, it'll, it'll, you know. In other words, in other words, we go to church, we all get happy, everybody's happy, da, 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 and you go out and something bad happens. You go, oh, oh, oh. you know what I mean? And it's gone. But at the moment in the service, you're thinking, there's nothing that could ever take this away. <laughs> Anybody ever said that? I mean, I know I have. I have a hundred times, for sure. This is part of what brought me to my knees to come to a revelation of Christ. Romans 7. Because I would be in service and I'd feel like, you know, King Kong, man. <laughs> oh, my baby. And I'd walk out and I'm telling you time and time again, I didn't get two steps out the door. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. Time and time again, I didn't get two steps out the door. And it just, <clears throat> and I'm going, what is this? Because, I mean, at the moment, I thought I could take on the world, and then just a few minutes later, it's gone, and I'm trying to find it. I'm going, where'd it go? Just a little bit. Just a little bit of that. It was gone. 
Well, soul encouragement is not enough. The Spirit's got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. You see, your spirit is strong in the Lord. Mm -hmm. But your spirit is not strong in itself because your spirit has to be strong in the Lord and the power of His mind. Mm -hmm. So the strengthening of your spirit isn't to make you strong spiritually. The strengthening of your spirit is so that you will lay hold of the Lord and be strong in the power of His mind. You're not going to hear that anywhere else. It should grow up that down. You'll never probably hear that again. So that I hear that. But that's because I've never heard that in 30 years. I've never heard anybody say that. But that's it. <clears throat> All right, let's. Uh, or at the very. Uh, well, let's go on to the purpose of regeneration. Get back into a right relationship with God. Two things. Oh, I already read that. Go to page 45, conversion without regeneration. We talked about conversion earlier. We know how it was an act of the soul. But conversion without regeneration is useless. To understand something or to be emotionally moved by a sermon is action taking place in the soul. If the speaker is clear enough, any average person can accept what he's saying is believable and pray a prayer. Any unsaved person can comprehend doctrine and tenets of faith and choose to agree with them. A man whose spirit is dead can be taught to sing Christian songs, pray words, and read the Bible. This man cannot grow spiritually until he has been born of the spirit. Religion may, have, may make you good, outwardly moral, or scripturally smart, but it does not put you in contact with God or in part life. Does that sound good? Anybody like that? All right, so next paragraph. God did not come to make a bad man good, but to make a dead man alive. Being able to quickly grasp concepts or being strong-willed is no substitute for a new life. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Many people preach by using their mind or stir the congregation by using emotions. But did they change people by Christ? Is that a good question? Mm -hmm. If anybody's ever going to minister here, would that be a good question to ask yourself before you share it is the spirit that quickens. In preaching, some people get emotionally or mentally psyched up. The doctrine of salvation is not what we are called to believe in. We must believe in the Son. Not the doctrine of salvation. We believe in the Son. The question is, has his spirit been quickened and brought into a knowledge and relationship with the living God? All right, next one. Born of the spirit, but living by the soul. There are many people in churches who have acknowledged doctrine, but who have not truly been regenerated. But that is not the only problem. It also is possible to be regenerated and yet still be governed by the soul instead of the spirit. Once you've been born of the spirit, what you had naturally before you were a Christian should not be what you lean on to serve God. That's a good sentence. You should underline that. <clears throat> Using what you had before you were born again, those talents and abilities to serve God, you should serve him by your spirit, which you didn't have before you were born again or certainly weren't functioning in it. Only that which has been newly imparted from God can contact and please God. Regeneration does not change daily government in the life of a believer. It only changes ownership. Being born again does not change your daily government. It only changes your ownership. The words sensual or natural found in James 3.15, Jude 19, 1 Corinthians 2.14 are words that really mean pertaining to the soul. They are from the Greek word suke. All speak of the soul as the governing factor in the life of the Christian. Zoe and suke are two different Greek words in our Bible. The soul life is very different from God's life. That would make sense. At creation, man became a living soul. He was not sinful, but his life was not Christ. God's life, Zoe, acts a certain way and has a certain fruit, and so does soul life. But while conversion without regeneration is not enough, neither is regeneration without the new birth. birth. God is not trying to make you well-adjusted in, you, in your spirit alone. He's not trying to make you well-adjusted in your spirit. That's the only goal. The goal of God is not just that our spirit be the boss over the rest of our being. That is part of the goal, but the greater is that God's ultimate goal is to subdue the rest of our being under the Lordship of Christ through the Spirit and to do it willingly. Gee, I didn't have to put that in there. I'm going to do it willingly. God wants the order to, of our spirit, soul, and body as one area of truth and also the reality of Christ flowing through us 
with that truth. We have a part in God's plan, which is to yield to his desires, but Jesus is the source and life from which we draw. All right, and the last part here deals with regeneration and new birth, and we've already talked about that, so we're going to read the last paragraph on page 46. So even if a man's human spirit is regenerated, there's still not the indwelling of the life of Christ without the new birth. There's a difference between the new man and a spiritual man, meaning you're operating by your spirit, but you're not operating by Christ. <clears throat> the new man is Christ. The spiritual man is the man who is governed and walks after the spirit. But also the divine life of Christ is imparted unto us, and we become partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. The nature of Christ is implanted within the spirit of man and does not desire to sin but serve God. Now that's part of the main thing is it's not related to sin or whatever we do. The main thing is it is his life, and you know it. It's not you for God. It is him. It is God functioning in you. All right, let's have a quick prayer. And one thing, thing I have a break, are you going to be 